Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. I've convened a panel of experts, even better friends, to discuss, to discuss the um, many abstracts that we had in the area of psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthritis. There's a lot to choose from. Let's hear from our panel. Eric, why don't you introduce yourself first? Sure. Eric Ruderman uh, from Northwestern in Chicago, as you can tell from my paraphernalia. <laughs> Hey, I'm Dr. Rachel Tate from West Palm Beach, Florida. I am Robert Chow from Fairfax, Virginia. All right, Robert, the elephant over the shoulder. It's ominous. It's um, the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, I need, I need to get an 800 pound gorilla behind me someday. Um, all right, so what, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to give us um, a synopsis of one of their favorite presentations from ULAR. 21. Let's begin with uh, Dr. Ritterman. Yeah, so I'm going to start with a little bit um, uh, unusual abstract. I, I'm going to pick a, a poster 245, which uh, was titled Impact of uh, Fibromyalgia on uh, Outcome Measures in, in Spa. And, and I thought this was really interesting. What they did, which was kind of cool, was they, they took 100 patients with fibromyalgia 100 patients with axial spinal arthritis and 100 patients with psoriatic arthritis. And the latter two groups included people who also had concomitant fibromyalgia. And they gave them all sort of standardized um, outcome measurement uh, questionnaires and scales, you know, either for AXPA for the AXPA group or for PSA for the PSA group. And they gave both to the, to the fibromyalgia group. And, and what they found first was that the fibromyalgia folks scored very high for disease activity on the usual AXPA scales and the PSA scales, not so surprising. And I don't think it's telling us that we would confuse those people. But what was more important, which was really interesting is that in the AXPA group, the patients who had fibromyalgia scored way higher on BASDI score and ASDAS score than the patients who didn't have fibromyalgia. And in the PSA group, the, the people who had fibromyalgia scored higher on the DAPSA, which is a composite score for psoriatic arthritis. And I think there's two pieces to that. It, it helps us say, you know, in clinical trials, you need to think about how much sort of concomitant fibromyalgia there is in the background. But it also speaks to what we see in clinical practice, which I've seen myself, which is the impact of that sort of chronic central pain on measuring outcomes. And we focused on this a lot in RA lately and trying to tease out the non-inflammatory pain. And this really sort of brought it home in AXPA and PSA as well, that that non-inflammatory pain makes a big difference when you assess um, disease activity. So Eric, you've seen these people and in all the diseases that we care for, it's great to see it here in SPA and PSA. Do you think there's hope that if you control SPA or PSA, that the, that the non-inflammatory pain also lessens significantly? Or do you, is that something separate you have to address? I, I think it's separate. I've seen it in a lot of my AXPA patients, and I think it's separate. And you get the inflammatory disease under control, but they continue to have pain. And it's a really important issue because you have to address that pain in other ways, either with duloxetine or pregabalin or, you know, a variety of other ways. And you have to acknowledge that changing their biologic isn't going to fix that. So I, they are kind of two separate issues. And many patients, once you start talking about it, recognize that. So Robert, how do you see these people in your clinic? Do you, can you easily spot them? Do this is actually, yeah, it's perfect. I actually had a patient today, a young lady with AS who by all measures, inflammatory markers are normal, you know, about the same mobility, flexion, extension of her, of her back, uh, but her shins and, and her, not her ankle, the joints are okay, the shins, but the skin around her ankle is just super sensitive. I mean, I, I press it, it hurts. I, it definitely hurts. She tells me it hurts. There's nothing wrong with it that I can tell. Um, and again, could this be some sort of centralized pain that's not being touched by our treatments? Or is there's, you know, something else that we can add on board besides our, you know, TNFs and IL-17s and, and all of those fancy biologics? So this is, this is the driver of care of cost, and don't you worry about, is this a driver, as Eric brings up, of clinical trials and clinical trial results? Yeah, uh, tough What to do you think, uh, Rachel? Oh, no, I agree, actually. Um, this, this is a decision-making skill set that I think we all need to work on, specifically for these types of patients. And um, it's not an easy answer, and it kind of 
this is timely, Eric, that you should bring this up because this is kind of leading into my what one of the um, posters that I chose to kind of highlight tonight too. So. Let's get into that. What was your favorite then, Rachel? Perfect. So I think favorite's kind of a hard choice. There's so many great ones, but I really enjoy the posters that make me kind of go, hmm, like why, why should I care about this or why do I need to know about this? So the poster I chose was um, OP0052. So it's looking at 449 patients from the Sierra cohort, and they evaluated remission based on ASDAS CRP at five years of follow-up for our patients, and um, responses are based on exposure to TNF inhibitors. So basically, they defined remission, as you guys already know, as to a CRP of less than 1.3. There were 247 patients who were not exposed to TNFs. 31% of those were found to be in remission. 55% were male, and 58% were also on concomitant NSAIDs. And then what's also interesting is that among the 202 patients who were TNF exposed, you also saw that only 34 were in remission at five years, 71% were men, and 28, or pardon me, 29% of those patients were also inside users. They found overall that the patients who were in remission were, were essentially male, they were HLAB 27 positive, they had high education levels and a lower BMI at five years in follow-up. But this study, I think um, it's a small study, it gives us a lot of information, However, I think there is a component of this that makes me wonder, are we looking at remission from only one standpoint and not really looking at the whole picture? So um, what do you guys think? Well, I'm struck by the remission number. Um, I'd almost like to see higher numbers, but I'm, I'm also really struck by the problem of women, you know, and, and that women, you know, it's especially with spondylitis, they are more difficult, they have more pain, whatever, but I mean, I, I, I find this data, if anything, tells me we need to do better. Eric, what do you think? Sorry, I was muted for a second. I, I think we need to do better, um, but it, it, it may sort of play into the stuff that I was talking about from the abstract I showed is that, you know, if someone's not in remission by ASDAS, you know, a specific cutoff, is some of that pain that isn't their sort of underlying X spa and, that, and we're not getting, they're not in remission. And, you know, I, I think you gotta be sort of careful about it when you sort of think about gender differences, um, but women tend to have more of that, that sort of central pain phenomenon, at least that's been observed. And so that may be some of that difference. I mean, you don't wanna just assume that's all it is, um, but I do, I think it speaks to that. And I think it, it sort of speaks to the idea of trying to understand you know, what it, is remission just control of the rheumatologic disease or is it control of all the elements that affect that patient? Exactly. Yeah, I, I tend to, you know, a lot of people fault measures like RAPID3 and uh, CDI, SDI, my gas score because they, well, they're falsely elevated by fibromyalgia and these non-inflammatory, and who cares? Is it that, That's I mean, important. it's a, it's important to the patient. It's still something we got to address. Uh, it's just a matter of identifying it and dealing with it. You know, and there are these studies out there that say if you have fibromyalgia, if you have depression, you're less likely to respond to therapy and you're less likely to achieve remission, which is what's being shown or suggested here in the first exactly. two abstracts. Um, Robert, any comment? Yeah, I mean, I think again, well, two things I'll say is the patient that I mentioned with AS that still has this kind of shin pain. She was female. And, you know, we, I do see it much more common in, in the females for sure. And number two is, you know, I think we can't forget about enthesitis. You know, there's a, a lot of sites of enthesis that simply, is it pain from, you know, what we think is centralized pain or is it actually enthesitis that we're just not picking up or, you know, different sites that we're not used to examining? You know, um, I think it's easy to uh, point to women as a frequent, um, exhibitor of this, but I think you can dispel that quite quickly by going to a VA clinic. You know, yeah. th this may very be, well be the phenomenon of women just more likely to seek medical attention. I've often said that men are the imbeciles of healthcare, and we're not going until they're dragging us to the clinic or the ER or whatever. And, you know, maybe you see women more commonly for this reason. But right. if I, I was always shocked at the VA clinic at how many men had really bad fibromyalgia and really bad amplified pain and whatnot. So 
Um, I, I I once had this discussion with Fred Wolf. I stayed at Fred Wolf's house, and if you know Fred Wolf, he's got more data than my like grandmother would say. Carter's got liver pills. Yes. And um, <laughs> and we spent a whole night one night talking about you know who has um, lower pain thresholds, and, and it melt, obviously women did have lower pain thresholds. And he showed me you know. And then we argued about which ethnic group, you know, and whatnot. But the idea is you can spend a lot of time on this, but it still is a prevalent problem uh, across the board. Rachel? Well, Jack, do you think this is also one of those instances where we're still trying to best define outcome measures for these subsets of patients, right? PSA and SPA, we're still trying to figure out how we should be categorizing this. I think this also highlights the idea that we need to really have rapid threes and, and gas scores and things available to really treat our patients. And um, I don't know about men having low or higher pain thresholds than women. I had a baby. So I'm just <laughs> saying, I don't know that I agree with that, but. No contest. We're not going to, <laughs> no low contender a here. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I, I, but I think you're right. I think that, you know, and Eric and others have reviewed the data showing that, you know, rapid three does work in multiple disciplines. It's not just an RA tool. And it is good. I like them because one, you then are more likely to, or you at least have a chance of being a treat to target doctor. Two, you can just look at a number and compare it for the last three visits and, and you know a lot. And lastly, really high numbers. Again, CDI, gas, rapid three, when you're over 30, I guarantee you there's an element of amplified pain. 100%. 100%. You're absolutely so right. So that's why we should be using these things. Um, Robert, tell, tell us your uh, uh, choice abstract. Yeah, so uh, my, my abstract actually is a talk by Dr. Laura Coates on the, uh, the need for personalization of psoriatic arthritis treatment. And you know, she, she obviously mentioned a lot of things, but I think two of the big things I wanted to highlight were, you know, number one, how sort of as a whole in psoriatic arthritis, we're lagging behind, especially compared to psoriasis. You know, again, you look at psoriasis measurements, they come now, now they're climbing to PASI 100 with their new IL-23s. We're still kind of across the board, roughly the same with measuring ACR 2040 and the efficacy is roughly the same if you compare all the kind of fancy biologics that we're using. Um, and then how do we personalize. You know, I think we are sometimes by default personalizing, not based on what a patient needs, but what a patient cannot take, like, you know, liver issues, kidney issues, IBD issues, whatever it may be, or really most of the time insurance issues. Uh, but then, and I think the key thing I really wanted to highlight here was not her, not a, a current abstract, but actually an upcoming, hopefully in the next year or two, uh, kind of propelling from a smaller Japanese study that was presented at ACR and I think uh, published last year. Um, and this was like a small study with 20, well, it really started with 60 patients, ended up with 26 patients, psoriatic arthritis and separating them based on uh, T cell expression, the TH1, TH17, and then individualizing treatment of TNF inhibitors, IL-17 and IL-1223 and seeing does selectively uh, selecting a biologic based on your, your, your T cell expression, does that actually uh, improve your response? They found some small signals with TNF, TNF inhibitors and I think IL-1223. IL-17 was simply too small. I think they only had one patient, so they couldn't really uh, compare that. And also they didn't have a placebo group. So that kind of, but it was very interesting uh, topic. I remember learning about it a few years ago and then it was nice to see Dr. Laura Coates present that and then she's actually in the process of working on the optimized study uh, uh, with many hospitals in the UK, pretty much selectively uh, c collecting TH17 uh, expression and then selectively uh, considering TNF inhibitors or IL-17 and seeing is there a selection difference if you screen for patients beforehand. And perhaps that'll help us, you know, um, select the best treatment and not just based on like a step treatment or whatever kind of paradigm that may not be the best for the patient. So I thought that was very interesting. Hopefully we have some promising results in, in the future. Um, Eric, you know, in RA, we have this problem of TNF first and when it comes to biologic choice and so much so that people go to their second or third and then other MOAs. But over the many years that these drugs have been out, we've learned that the MOAs actually work just as well first line. Uh, as TNFs and TNFs are mainly just a habit or something driven by 
in payers uh, forcing that cho that choice. Have we seen the same thing evolve in um, AXPA and and also in psoriatic disease? I, I think a little bit. You know, I, there was a there was a, I think it was a rheumatologist in Dallas who once said, "You dance with the one who brung you." And, and, you know, I think we get used to TNF inhibitors and we've been doing it for a long time. It, it, it has changed in DERM. And that's, you know, and, and, and I think we alluded to that. It has really changed in DERM because as they've sort of moved up into other biologics, mm -hmm. first IL-17, then into IL-23 inhibitors, they've really moved the needle on skin response. And that's changed things. And so dermatologists are very quick to start with an IL-17 or an IL-23 inhibitor in a way that we aren't. And I think sort of, you know, going back to, to, to where Robert started, we haven't really moved that needle. And so there isn't a huge impetus to say, well, why would it make more sense? Maybe I just use the drug I've been using for 20 years. Um, and, and that's not personalized. And I, and I do like the idea of sort of saying, well, maybe that's not the right answer for every patient. I mean, that Japanese study was really interesting. What they didn't do, unfortunately, is I don't think they they, they assigned people to the right treatment groups. They didn't have the right co controls there to see what would happen if you made those choices. And so you, you, you saw the numbers, but you didn't see sort of, if you use that to make treatment decisions, what happened. But I think that is really interesting and, and, and shows a lot of promise. There, there's also the other piece that I, I do think you don't want to lose track of here. And, and that's personalization, not just on biology, but on patient needs, because Patients, particularly with psoriatic disease, have different issues. You know, for some people, it's their joint disease. For some people, it's their skin disease. And trying to, I think you have to bring that in. You can't just work just the biology and say, this is the right drug for you, because it may not address the issues for that patient. And I think we really do need to, to plug all that in, you know, and, and uh, on that topic, a plug for you know, the GRAPA guidelines that were um, presented at this meeting, they're still not finalized, but they sort of do that. They break everything apart and show what works in different areas and, and let us work with patients to pick therapies that in some ways is more personalized. Rachel, how do you personalize your treatment choices in SPA? Well, I mean, aside from what we all do, which is hopefully listening to our patients and better defining their own domains, I mean, I, I think I came out of ULAR um, feeling very, not overwhelmed in the sense of the sheer volume of information, which we all do, but also because we have so many treatment options. I can, I call it the paradox of choice, right? We have, we have finally reached a stage in PSA and SPA where we have so many different options for patients, but we really have to be cognizant, I guess, of listening to our patients and making better choices for them. Clearly, some patients are not going to be a good fit for a JAK inhibitor. Clearly, they're not going to be a good fit for an IL-1223. We have information, but we need to better hone in on how to really do that for each individual patient. And I think the only way that I do it in clinic is I talk to the patient and I keep reevaluating at every single interval at every single visit. Um, and if things change, I have to be willing to make changes with the patient for the patient. But shared decision making should not be undervalued. It's a very important topic for patients right now, and especially for us when we're making so many choices. But those GRAPA guidelines, as Eric alluded to, they're a great start. Um, they still give us a lot of good information, but I need a little more personalization. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's going to be big money, uh, big numbers and mo money ball approach to this that will make us smarter, but um, any edge is going to be a good edge for the patient. Um, my quick abstract um, is abstract OP0010 uh, uh, and everybody's favorite topic, fecal my microbiota transplants and psoriatic arthritis, FMTs. This is a Danish study of 31 patients. Uh, active PSA patients on methotrexate, and they either got the FMT um, regimen or they got a placebo. And guess what? You know, a disease that we think has got a significant microbiome dis, uh, dysbiosis in play, um, this didn't seem to do any good. In fact, placebo outperformed uh, FMT with um, uh, less treatment failures, 15% versus 60%. Um, an equal number of need for future biologic DMARDs, et cetera, 
but no difference in safety. And in a, in a, in a meeting that I didn't cover all of it, but Eric, there was a lot about this biosis um, at this meeting. Why did this fail so miserably? I, I think probably because it's, it's still way too complicated a problem. I mean, it, it, isn't, it isn't as simple as saying, you know, if you've got active psoriatic arthritis, you're missing a certain category of, of, you know, bacteria in your gut, or you have too much of another, and we just sort of need to reset the balance and get you sort of back to normal gut. I, that's a, that's a way too simplified way of looking at it. Um, because it's, it's, it, it's the interaction, it's the interplay. And there's a huge genetic component to all of these, which I think is really important. I, I find myself having this discussion with patients all the time because patients, you know, patients always come in and they ask you, can I change my diet and make my disease better? And, and my answer is, yeah, but I don't know how. And, and the problem is that, you know, I, I do think that as we tease this apart, we may be able to, to make some inroads there, but there's, there's so many pieces to it. It's what's happening in the household. It's what bacteria everybody in the house is exposed to. It's genetics. It's, you know, it, it is diet. There's all these different pieces. And so I, I, I'm not honestly terribly surprised that that sort of blanket approach with a simple sort of fecal transfer to say, well, we're just going to give you back the, the bacteria that you're missing didn't work because I think it's way more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's do a sort of quick round as we close out um, and, and hear another abstract that you liked uh, from the meeting. Robert? Yeah, another abstract I liked was a uh, poster uh, 0194. This was a uh, enthesitis uh, topic. And I was looking into enthesitis in the psoriatic arthritis patients. It was the uh, post hoc analysis on the EXCEED study, head to head trial of uh, adalimumab and cepikinumab. And pretty much it showed that they both improved enthesitis about equally. Uh, they had equal uh, uh, enthesitis evaluation. So the bottom line is it did not show much of a difference between the two. I think the takeaway point, though, was that in patients with moderate or severe, or more, mostly severe enthesitis, the improvement was not as much. So I think what this tells us is, okay, both of these, again, going back to sort of personalization of medicine of these of treatment of psoriatic arthritis patients, they both work pretty well. Heidi trees between the two. Can't really tell from this in terms of enthesitis, but we know for those two, when it's severe enthesitis, you know, maybe is is it as good as placebo, maybe waiting as long as six months? So we're still left with a lot, a lot of questions in terms of severe enthesitis. Yeah. Yeah. Rachel? So I'm gonna do uh, another brilliant Dr. Laura Coates um, from Oxford study. This was OP0230, the COSMOS trial. I know we're familiar with that, but just a little recap, it was a phase three gazilkumab versus placebo in patients who had failed at least one to two TNF inhibitors. And what I wanna highlight about this particular trial is that the forest plot didn't really show any difference between the placebo patients who received baseline methotrexate versus gazolcumab patients. Also, who could have received methotrexate? It was about 50% of those patients. Um, but also, interestingly, and it's probably because it wasn't powered to do so, it didn't show a difference between those patients who had failed one TNF versus two TNFs who were then randomized into the gazolcumab um, arm. So I think this is interesting because at the end of the day, we need to know next steps. Should we be choosing one drug over another? I think it highlights what we've already talked about. Cool. Eric. Well, I, I, I swear we didn't plan this ahead of time, but I'm going to piggyback on Rachel's. And, and the one I, I, I thought was really interesting was um, poster 1032, which was a, a post hoc analysis of the select PSA trial, which is uh, opatacitinib. So we're all kind of waiting on opatacitinib and psoriatic arthritis. I think we've all been quite excited by the phase three data that showed the skin response was was really good for an oral agent. And, and I think it offers a, a promise. And we've gotten used to over the years that the more drugs you've been on, the less likely you are to respond to the next drug. And, and that was in fact the case in the Cosmos trial because the, the response rates there were somewhat less than were seen in the sort of just conventional DMARD failures um, who were treated in an earlier study with um, gazelcomab. So, but in this analysis, it was really interesting when they looked at the hepatocytin trial in this trial that was bio DMARD failures, it didn't matter which type of biologic had previously failed, whether it was an IL-17 or a TNF inhibitor, 
the response rate was about the same. And more interestingly, if you'd failed one, two, or three biologics, the response rate was still about the same. And so I think that says it's a, it's a totally different mechanism. And maybe our sort of experience that, you know, the more you've tried, the more you've selected out people who just aren't going to respond may not be the case in this situation, which is really intriguing. And and, and I think gives us a lot of hope when this hits the market that it may offer some promise from people who haven't done well with what we've tried, you know, tried them on so far. Do you, there's some evidence in, in RA, I'm sorry to, to make that analogy, that uh, obviously you lose response the more you fail TNFs. You know, you go from a 60, 40, 20 to a 50, you know, 30, 15, whatever, but less so if you go to other MOAs. So are these impressive responses despite multiple failures just be uh, the result of class switching? I, I think that's a lot of it. I do. I do think it's a lot of it. But what we've also seen in RA is that the more drugs you fail, the less likely you are to respond to the next one, e even with different MOAs. You know, you get to people who've been on two, three, four different drugs. You're getting your, your odds of responding to the next thing you throw at them is going to be less. And, and here, you know, people who have failed three different biologics would presumably not all just TNFs. There may have been an IL-17 in, in there still responded. So I do think, yes, a lot of it is probably class switching and, and that's not unexpected. But it also it, it gives us hope that there's maybe there's something different about going to a small molecule that sort of essentially wipes the slate clean for the biologics you failed before. I'm at least hopeful for that. So my quickie to end on has to do with the cravacentinib, the TIC2 inhibitor, I'll call it the deuce. You know, two interesting, <laughs> two interesting abstracts, poster 0198 showing the deuce works better than placebo in active psoriatic arthritis. Not a surprise, but encouraging that a new, slightly different MOA um, has promise and hope, and these are early trials. And likewise, we hinted at this result, or we heard about this result at the end of last year, about a head-to-head -head of the deuce versus a primalast in patients with psoriasis. Um, and also placebo in that trial, that's poster um, 1042, where um, the deuce was better than a primalast and both were better than uh, placebo in the usual skin only outcomes. There were maybe 18% of people in that trial who had PSA, but they didn't really talk about the PSA responses. This was a skin response, but I think it's encouraging. The only question is, Will it be as good as the Jacks? Will it be safer than the Jacks? Or is it just another Jack spelt wrongly? <laughs> Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Exactly. It's certainly better tolerated in that in those studies. In the psoriasis studies, you know, the, they had the usual apremolase toxicities, the headache, the nausea, the diarrhea. Um, but it, the, the ducravacidin was really well tolerated. And, and it's interesting because you usually sort of trade off tolerability for efficacy. And they, they sort of got both. They got better efficacy and better tolerability. Um, I haven't done this with other panels, but I want to ask each of you, what do you think of the ULAR uh, virtual Congress? And um, not so much a comment on ULAR, but has virtual meetings gotten any easier or better? Eric? You know, I think they've gotten better and they've been able to plan ahead. It's still challenging. It, it, I feel some, found myself having trouble sort of finding my way around sometimes, finding the stuff I wanted. You know, very difficult attending a Congress uh, across the pond at a, in a different time zone because they had a lot of live things going on that were in the middle of the night here. And, you know, that, that there's no way they get around that. But that was kind of frustrating. Um, it, you know, but I think I, I do see that it'll help us down the road with some more hybrid Congresses that maybe if you can't attend in person, this is a way to, to see what's going on and to, to learn something. Robert, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think in terms of capacity in the future, I can definitely see capacity, hopefully increasing, doubling, who knows, you know, because now you have both at home and in person. But yeah, I, I agree, you know, in, in terms of just accessibility, it's still obviously would prefer to go in person. And then the last thing was, I, I think I really appreciated the fact that uh, they actually uploaded the, the uh, on-demand pretty right, you know, pretty much right away or whenever the uh, session started. So that made, at least for us, you know, uh, over here in America, much, much faster to give us much faster access to those lectures. The sad part about these meetings is I get really good at navigating uh, on the last day and uh, yeah. first few days. I'm, I was taking Rachel's advice and um, you could find the abstracts and posters better if you did a Google search. Rachel, your impression? 
Yeah, I mean, we we talked about this a little in the sense of I like that everything was loaded ahead of time. So I knew where to find posters. I could do that easily. I also will say I commend them tremendously for having not only the presenters, but also the Q&A, the live Q&As that continued up pretty quickly on the, the live stream. But honestly, this is an issue of access. I wouldn't have been able to attend ULR this year in Paris without having the option um, kind of like telemed for some of our patients. So I think this is a wonderful thing. I hope it continues. I know it is a bear to do and I, the platforms I'm sure while built are expensive. So I hope it continues because I would like to be able to use that. So and 4 a.m. Eric was easy um, over here in oh. Florida this year with the little <laughs> one. So yeah, so our advice for future virtual meetings is have a baby uh, and, after the, and after the 3 a.m. feed, you can tune yeah. in for the live presentations. You're, you're up. It's there true. You. All right. Thanks to the panel. Great discussion. Tune in the room now. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Jack. Thanks.